You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, everyone. It's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This week's episode is about nonviolent communication, which is a framework for negotiating and communicating. I've had lots of people ask me my thoughts on nonviolent communication over the years. And just recently, I asked in the Voluntary Life Facebook group for suggestions for show topics. And this is one of the ones that came up again. So I thought I would do an episode on it. By the way, you can join the Voluntary Life Facebook group by becoming a patron of the Voluntary Life on Patreon. And I'd like to say a big thank you to my new patron this week, who is Alex B. Patrons of the Voluntary Life get access to loads of rewards, including bonus episodes. And I've just released bonus episode 13, which is called Making a Big Change in Life. If you're interested in supporting the show, you can find out more information at patreon.com slash thevoluntarylife. Or you can find links on my website, thevoluntarylife.com, and I'll put a link in the show notes as well. So on to this week's episode about nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication is an approach to negotiating and communicating developed by someone called Marshall Rosenberg, and it's written up in a book called Nonviolent Communication. Rosenberg developed this approach in the 1960s onwards, and it has a kind of 1960s flavor to it. It feels to me like it's from its time. Some people even think of it as kind of a spiritual practice. So it does have that sort of 60s feel to it. But it is a framework for negotiation and for communicating and resolving conflicts. And I think it has some useful insights and some helpful ideas and also have some criticisms of it. I read the book Nonviolent Communication a long time ago. I think maybe even eight or ten years ago. And there is an episode of the Psychology Book Club, which is another podcast that I do with my wife, Hannah, uh, from years and years ago, from maybe eight or 10 years ago, where we talked about nonviolent communication with other people interested in psychology who took part in a Skype call. So I'll put a link to that conversation in the show notes in case you're interested in more detail. There is a relatively good Wikipedia page about nonviolent communication, and I will just read you the summary from the Wikipedia page as a bit of background. Nonviolent communication, abbreviated NVC, also called compassionate communication or collaborative communication, is a communication process developed by Marshall Rosenberg beginning in the 1960s. It focuses on three aspects of communication. Self-empathy, defined as a deep compassionate awareness of one's own inner experience. Empathy, defined as understanding of the heart in which we see the beauty in the other person. And honest self-expression, defined as expressing oneself authentically in a way that is likely to inspire compassion in others. Nonviolent communication is based on the idea that all human beings have the capacity for compassion and only resort to violence or behavior that harms others when they do not recognize more effective strategies for meeting their needs. Habits of thinking and speaking that lead to the use of violence, psychological and physical, are learned through culture. NVC theory supposes that all human behavior stems from attempts to meet universal human needs and that these needs are never in conflict. Rather, conflict arises when strategies for meeting needs clash. NVC proposes that if people can identify their needs, the needs of others, and the feelings that surround these needs, harmony can be achieved. While NVC is ostensibly taught as a process of communication designed to improve compassionate connection to others, it has also been interpreted as a spiritual practice, a set of values, a parenting technique, an educational method, and a worldview. I think that's quite a good overview of the approach from Wikipedia. And there are also a number of techniques and specific aspects to this approach. So, for example, uh, Marshall Rosenberg suggested four components to communication that are part of the nonviolent communication approach. The first of those components is observation. So that is where you observe kind of neutrally what is going on. Rather than criticizing another person that you're negotiating with, you just observe what's happening. So you might say, for example, if you were in a, having a dispute with your partner, you might say, you left the room when I was speaking to you. And then the second step in the process is about expressing feelings. And so this is where you would just simply express how you feel about 
whatever it is that you're observing. So you might say, I felt angry when that happened. And then the third step is that you express your needs. And the idea behind this in nonviolent communication is that there are a basic set of universal human needs and that you, everyone has the same kind of universal needs. And the need in this case might be something like connection and for attention or to, to be listened to or something like that. And so you express your need and then you make a request. For example, in this case, I request that you don't leave the room when I'm trying to talk to you. I feel frustrated when that happens. I feel angry or, or whatever that might be. So that's a very basic overview of nonviolent communication with a little bit of detail about some of the techniques or approach that NVC uses. And now I will give you my own experience of NVC and my own thoughts about it, what I like about it, and some of the aspects of it that I think are a bit confused and flawed. I haven't found that NVC has made uh, as big an impression on me as I know it has made on some people. I know NVC is something that a lot of people have found incredibly helpful in their own lives. And there are some very devoted NVC practitioners that I've met who've, who've found it to be a great help in their personal relationships and in resolving conflicts and so forth. I did not find NVC to be that helpful. I read it a long time ago, and it's one of those books that I don't find myself thinking about a lot. Although I did find that there are some very useful insights in it, I personally find that there are other places where the insights of NVC are expressed more clearly and more coherently than in NVC itself. But it does contain some useful insights. For example, I think it's very helpful that NVC focuses on seeking win-win outcomes in negotiations. That is not the way that Marshall Rosenberg would express it. He talks about everyone getting their needs met. But the way that I would express it is to say that NVC is an approach to negotiation which doesn't think of conflict as a zero-sum game. It's an approach which does think it's possible to find ways for there to be benefits to both parties in a negotiation, for there to be a win-win outcome. In NVC language, that would mean everyone getting their needs met. So I think that's very helpful. Another thing that I think is very helpful about NVC is as an approach to negotiation, NVC has a lot of focus on distinguishing between what your needs are and what your strategies are for, for meeting those needs. And it's very helpful to distinguish between those two things. That's a distinction that you find in other approaches to negotiation as well, expressed using different language. So, for example, uh, the book that I think is the best book on negotiation, which is Getting to Yes by Fisher and Yuri, talks about making a distinction between your negotiating position and your interests. So your position might be, I will offer you X thousand dollars for this apartment. Whereas your interests might be that you want an apartment that meets your requirements and within, is within your budget. And you also want to reach an agreement that you believe is fair market value or something like that. So the point is to make a distinction between specific things that you ask for from other people and the actual needs behind those specific requests. And nonviolent communication also makes this useful distinction between the specifics and your actual interests, your needs. So I think that's very helpful. Another thing that nonviolent communication focuses on, which I think is very helpful, is talking about yourself and not criticizing others. So the idea is rather than in negotiation, talking about the other person saying you are being obstinate, what you're doing is not fair. These are all things that you say about the other person. And what nonviolent communication suggests as an approach to negotiating is talk about your own needs and your own feelings rather than criticize the other person. And I think as a general approach in negotiation, this is very helpful. And it really makes a lot of sense because you are responsible for yourself and you can speak for yourself. You can't speak for the other person. And if you want to have effective communication with someone, it really makes sense to talk about the things that you're responsible for, which is your own feelings, your own wants, your own desires, your own requests, your own needs and your own thoughts. And so I think that's really good. 
I have heard this particular insight into negotiation expressed in other places as well. And one of the places that I think it's expressed very well is in Thomas Gordon's book, Parent Effectiveness Training. And he has a concept which he calls I messages, which he's talking to parents about effective ways to communicate with their children. And his suggestion is rather than say, you have to do this or you have to do that. Thomas Gordon talks to parents about speaking to their children in I messages. I am feeling stressed that we're going to be late. So please, can you put your jacket on or whatever it is? So the idea is you as a parent speak in I messages and it's a way of focusing communication in terms of the things that you feel and you think rather than talking about the other person, which is particularly helpful when speaking to children. But in general, this approach is applicable in any communication or any time that you want to have an effective communication with someone. So that's another insight of NVC that I do like and do find helpful. But there are some aspects of NVC that I think are a bit confused. And I think some of the ideas of NVC actually muddy the waters and make negotiation less clear because NVC has a particular theory of conflict, a particular philosophy about conflict underlying it. And that philosophy, I think, is basically incorrect. So let me explain what I mean. The the NVC theory of conflict is that conflict arises from miscommunication. In particular, conflict happens because of so-called violent modes of communication, and that is coercive or manipulative language that aims to induce fear, guilt, and shame. And the idea is that when you use those kinds of communication, you divert attention of the participants in a negotiation away from clarifying their needs, their feelings, their perceptions, and their requests. So there are a number of problems with this theory of conflict. The two key problems are that Not all conflict is due to miscommunication or lack of empathy. And communication itself is not violent. It's not a question of whether the communication is violent or nonviolent. So let me just go through those two points um, in, in detail. So the idea that conflict is a result of lack of empathy and miscommunication is not correct. And I'd like to give you a quote about empathy and the role of empathy in reducing conflict from Steven Pinker, who wrote The Better Angels of Our Nature. I've actually done a review of that book in a previous episode, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But he made a very good criticism of this idea of the importance of empathy in reducing violence in conflicts. And he pointed out that, although this is a very popular idea, it's actually somewhat misguided. So I'm going to read you this quote in full because I think it's quite helpful. Pinker says this, Now, I have nothing against empathy. I think empathy is, in general, though not always, a good thing. An expansion of empathy may help explain why people today abjure cruel punishments and think more about the human costs of war. But empathy today is becoming what love was in the 1960s, a sentimental ideal extolled in catchphrases, what makes the world go round, what the world needs now, all you need, but overrated as a reducer of violence. When the Americans and Soviets stop rattling nuclear sabers and stoking proxy wars, I don't think love had much to do with it or empathy either. And though I like to think that I have as much empathy as the next person, I can't say that it's empathy that prevents me from taking out contracts on my critics, getting into fistfights over parking spaces, threatening my wife when she points out that I've done something silly, or lobbying for my country to go to war with China to prevent it from overtaking us in economic output. My mind doesn't stop and ponder what it would be like to be the victims of these kinds of violence and then recoil after feeling their pain. My mind never goes in these directions in the first place. They are absurd, ludicrous, unthinkable. Yet options like these clearly were not unthinkable to past generations. The decline of violence may owe something to an expansion of empathy, but it also owes much to harder-boiled faculties like prudence, reason, fairness, self-control, norms and taboos, and conceptions of human rights. End of quote. Now, I think that is a really helpful 
critique of this idea that it is empathy that prevents us from resorting to violence and it's empathy that enables us to reach peaceful outcomes in negotiations. And rather than this NVC idea that conflicts arise from miscommunication and lack of empathy, I think there's actually a much deeper reason that humans have conflicts with each other. And the deeper philosophical reason for conflicts is that we live in a world of scarcity. All conflict ultimately arises from scarcity. And this is an idea from economics. If you just imagine this thought experiment, if you could have anything that you wanted whenever you imagined it, you would have no basis to conflict with other people because, to use the terms of nonviolent communication, you could get all your needs met immediately by having whatever it was that you wanted. But we live in a universe which has scarcity as part of its fundamental nature. So if you are currently listening to this, standing in one spot or sitting in one place, there is only that one place in this universe. And if you're sitting there, nobody else can sit there. If you happen to be listening to this podcast with a set of headphones, then that particular set of headphones is scarce. There's only one of them. And if you're using them, nobody else can use them. Of course, there are many other sets of headphones in the world and we can create more and more headphones. And in fact, we can produce enough headphones for everyone to have five sets of headphones each if we want to. But the point is, any particular physical object is itself scarce. So your headphones that you're using right now are scarce in the sense there's only one of them. And if you're using them, then nobody else can. And that's just a fundamental characteristic of the universe resources are scarce. And that means that they are, in to, to use a term from economics, they are rivalrous. That is to say that we can come into conflict over them. So any time that two people, two or more people, might want to use any particular object or resource, there is the potential for them to, con to come into conflict over it. If you're currently using your headphones and somebody else comes along and wants to use your headphones there's the potential for you two to come into conflict over who gets to use the headphones. And the reason I'm going into all this detail about this somewhat abstract philosophical point about the origins of conflict is to answer the question, how do we avoid conflict? And the answer is, we need principles. We need principles to avoid conflict. And it's principles that allow us to determine who gets to use your headphones and who doesn't get to use your headphones. And these principles are things like the non-aggression principle, that it's wrong to initiate aggression against another person or to take their stuff. And fundamentally, underneath the non-aggression principle is a deeper principle, and that's the principle of objective property rights. The right to control particular objects is something that we need to have objective rules about, rules like the first person to find something is the owner, or if you create something yourself or transform your own property in a new way, then it's still your property. These kinds of basic rules of objective property rights are the kinds of principles that allow us to prevent conflict between human beings. And that kind of principle is, goes far further than just objects like headphones. It also applies to things like your own body. So if you have the right to use your body, then other people don't have the right to use your body. And it's a violation if somebody physically attacks you or assaults you or tries to make you do something that you don't want to do. And we need these kinds of principles in order to prevent us from coming into conflict with each other. And one of the things that Stephen Pinker talks about in that book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is a book about the decline in violence over the years, historically, and how, you know, humans are better at living together in peace now. One of the things he talks about is the increase in our understanding of these kinds of principles, principles like human rights, which ultimately are about respecting each other's physical integrity and property and, and so forth. So to come back to nonviolent communication, I think that NVC doesn't really understand 
that aspect of the origin of conflict. NVC is phrased in a very much in terms of miscommunication and empathy when actually it's objective principles, rational principles that are what we really need in order to prevent conflict with each other. I have some other criticisms of NVC. I guess this is partly to do with my own experience of seeing people who are really into NVC. I find that people who really like nonviolent communication sometimes speak and communicate using the jargon of NVC a lot. And ironically, although nonviolent communication is all about being authentic and expressing yourself authentically, when someone talks to me using a lot of jargon, it sounds less authentic to me. It doesn't sound like it's really coming from the heart and it's really that person expressing themselves. It sounds like they're speaking in in rather clumsy pre-packaged terms that they've got from nonviolent communication. When I hear those phrases, when they say things like, I have a need for X, I kind of hear that jargon and I don't feel that this is a really intimate and empathetic communication. And so I think that's a kind of ironic side effect of NVC is that it actually doesn't make me feel closer to the people who really practice it a lot. And that's just a personal experience that I've had with people who are really into NVC. And although I think nonviolent communication has some helpful insights, I personally think that those insights are better expressed elsewhere. So the books that I've read that have expressed the same insights in different ways have really stayed with me much more than nonviolent communication. For example, one of the big aspects of of, um, NVC is about negotiation And I've always found that Getting to Yes by Fisher and Urey is a much clearer framework for understanding principled negotiation. And I found that book much more helpful than MVC in terms of my own experience as a negotiator. So I would recommend checking out Getting to Yes by Fisher and Urey. As I said, it talks about some similar insights like distinguishing between your interests and your negotiating position or what in NVC would be called your needs and your strategies. I also found that parent effectiveness training by Peter Gordon is a better version of some of the NVC approaches about talking about your own feelings and talking about yourself. I mentioned that parent effectiveness training has this idea of I messages and I personally just found that to be a clearer version of some of these insights that, that that NVC has. And with regards to the philosophy of conflict and understanding what underlies human conflict, this is a bit more abstract, but if you're interested in that, there's a book called The Economics and Ethics of Private Property by Hans Hermann Hopper. You can get a free copy of that on the internet. That's a very dense book and it's very complex, but it does clearly explain this idea that the origins of human conflict are in scarcity and that to overcome conflict peacefully, we need principles, principles like non-aggression and objective rules for determining property rights and so forth. So that's my thoughts on nonviolent communication. It's an approach that has some helpful insights, but those I believe are more clearly expressed elsewhere. And it has a rather confused analysis of conflict, which I think is at the root of some of the problems with NVC. In many ways, NVC, I I think, is really of its time, of the 1960s. It's an approach that doesn't really understand some aspects of economics and philosophy, but is very much focused on empathy. And I think that's actually quite characteristic of a lot of the ideas that were around in the 1960s. So it's very much of its time. There you go. Those are my thoughts on NVC. I hope you found that helpful. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me know what you think. That's all for this week's episode. I'll be back next week with another episode. In the meantime, I hope you have a great week. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you like this podcast, please show your support by becoming a patron of The Voluntary Life on Patreon. Your support will help to grow and improve the show, and you'll get access to a treasure trove of rewards, including bonus episodes. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to learn more.